This episode of Dana Being Dana is brought to you in part by Grow Wellness Group, counseling, coaching, and wellness for community, work, and life. Hello, and welcome to Dana Being Dana. I'm Dana Michelle, and I'm thrilled you're with us. My show is about all different aspects of the human connection, things that bring us together and living life intentionally. Nothing brings us together like grief. Grief of a diagnosis, grief of a relationship coming to an end, grief over losing a job, grief of a loved one. These days, we are not even able to grieve like we are accustomed to grieving. Joining me now are my friends, Kimberly Lawler and Teresa Lawton, and Susan Harvey, a therapist of Grow Wellness Group. Thank you all so much for joining me. Kim, you are the daughter, the only daughter, of Phil Lawler. He is an icon of Naperville. Um, he was a legend of fitness and baseball and living life intentionally, which just resonates with me. Um, it's the 10th anniversary mm -hmm. of, his, of his passing. Uh, can you tell us about your dad's battle with cancer? I can, and as we all know, uh, cancer doesn't discriminate, and it was a seven-year battle. Wow. And you know, you have all the hope and strength in the beginning that you're going to beat this, you've got this, we're going to have the surgery, go through chemotherapy and the radiation, and no matter what, we're going to get through this. And by the time seven years go by, of the roller coaster ride of ups and downs and mm -hmm. remission and cancer spreading. It's just, you lose a lot of the will on both sides, yeah. the fight. So it was, it was an exhausting battle. Yeah. And unfortunately, cancer won this time. What type of cancer did your father It originated have? in his colon. colon. And then finally, what took him was lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Teresa, when you and I met, I felt like it was meant to be. Uh, we met at a restaurant in Naperville, and um, I sat with your family. Your family and I were seated together, and I started talking to your husband, Brett. And um, he was a Marine veteran and a Lyle police officer for over 20 years, and he, too, was battling cancer at the time. Um, he passed in 2019. Can you tell us a little bit about his, his three-year battle with yes. cancer? And we were so fortunate to meet you yes. and your lovely family. And we had just uh, moved into Naperville um, in our long-term home, our forever home. And it was late June of 2016. And we had a beautiful three-year-old daughter. And we were trying to have our second child. And life was great. And then three months later, we received a diagnosis that no one is ever ready to handle and especially at the young age of 40. Mm -hmm. And we, that, it was September 23rd, 2016. I will remember that date forever ingrained in my, in my mind. That was the day that um, my journey of grief began and Brett was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. It had already spread to his liver and both lungs. Mm. And our world was turned upside down in just minutes. Um, we were, we thought we were going to be going to see a fertility specialist that week to try and see what else we could do to have a second child. And yet it was, our focus was changed and we were seeing oncologists and social workers and getting a PET scan and having a liver biopsy and putting a port in his chest mm -hmm. so that he could start chemotherapy that following week. But just a week after that diagnosis, that terminal diagnosis that we received, we actually had a ray of sunshine. We found out we were expecting, and we call him Miracle Max. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we definitely knew it was going to be a boy just so that Brett's legacy would be able to continue mm -hmm. on. And Brett, throughout Brett's whole battle with cancer, he remained positive and strong and courageous. And he always was helping others and putting um, helping others as a priority yeah. and that actually showed so much when um, he actually had his fifth life-saving award after coming off of 40 straight hours of chemotherapy he was still a full-duty police officer at the time and um, he was in the right place at the right time and he was able to save a man's life by CPR he truly mm -hmm. is a hero to so many yeah. mm -hmm. you, you touched me because I remember Max was a newborn 
when we met. He was he was in his little um, carrier when we met. So um, one thing that you said, you talked about your grief journey began upon the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, you've also lost, and I want to come back to that. You've also lost your father with it during this time frame too. Tell us about that. Yes, it was about two years into Brett's battle with cancer when I lost my father to complications from pancreatic cancer. And my father was also an army veteran and he fought valiantly, but there was just so many complications after the multiple surgeries that he had to endure. And I'm just so thankful and blessed that um, our wonderful kids were able to meet their kind and loving yeah. papa mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even you know with all that I feel like I truly didn't get to fully grieve my mm -hmm. father's death mm -hmm. because simultaneously I was already grieving and processing my husband's ultimate death yeah. mm -hmm. and losing the two most important men in my life at the same time it was truly devastating absolutely I think what I've been really struck by in hearing both of your stories is how your assumptive worlds were torn apart and what you knew and what was familiar and even what you expected, right? And when we think about our assumptive world, that's a part of our grief story and how we respond to that can help kind of tell us how are we grieving. One thing that, that Teresa had talked about was um, experiencing multiple mm -hmm grief situations at, at, at once. And mm -hmm. I think that's especially true now um, in 2020 mm -hmm. with everything that has been happening mm -hmm. in our world. Can you talk about that and, yeah. and how multiple aspects of grief or multiple mm -hmm. things that people are going through mm -hmm. um, can impact the grief process and yeah. those who experience it? Yeah. When we're talking about complicated grief, we know that certainly multiple losses can add to complicated grief. We know that a grief response is normal, and all of us will experience grief differently. There are no shoulds in grief, but it's good to recognize when there are multiple losses. I think another thing that's important for all of us to recognize is the loss of a support system. And with, you know, with what's been going on lately with COVID-19, I think it's important to recognize how our support systems maybe feel like they're yanked away. And how do we then make meaning out of our losses? How do we continue the bonds with our loved ones who have died? And how do we move forward with a, what kind of a support system can we put in place for ourselves? So I think those are really important that's things so, to remember. I think that's so true. And both mm -hmm. of you had very young children mm -hmm. uh, when you went through these experiences. Let's talk about your support system. In what ways did people do that well for you? Because I think there are incredible blessings mm -hmm. when it comes to going through hard times because there are people who do show up. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to talk about you know, what, what things could have been done better because there's sometimes people don't respond well to grief. Mm -hmm. um, they don't respond well to hardship. And some of the people that you thought would be there turned out to not be. So can you talk a little bit about your support system uh, particularly when you were in some of those valley, valley moments and times. Yeah, so I can start my, um, you know, my brothers and my mom are still very local. And I think you kind of almost isolate yourself in the beginning because you don't, you, you get exactly what each other is going through. And then you have friends that are reaching out, which is always very sweet, but you, you just feel like, well, they just don't know how mm -hmm. I'm feeling. And so it's hard. it was very mm -hmm. difficult for me, and to be honest, um, to con to open up to people. I almost became very shell-shocked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my brothers would recognize that and, and my husband as well. And, you know, and my kids helped, right? It helped some have some normalcy to be a mother, but I still just didn't know at that point how to be a wife or how to then be a, a sister. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, was, it, was a, it was a difficult time back yeah, then. Yeah, and that's real, that's mm -hmm. honest. Yes, it's always hard to take when you're used to being the giver. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to receive some of those um, gifts or help mm -hmm. from others. Say that again, because I think it's true. It. The hard, it's hard to take Yeah, mm -hmm. when so you're used hard. to giving. Mm -hmm. It's hard to receive. I think that's so true. I think a lot of people um, can relate to that. Yeah, and I felt like 
people that showed up help me the most. So exactly like you said, Dana, um, don't ask me what, what I can, what I need, um, because honestly, there's so much going through my mind at that time that I can't think about what I need. Um, you know, I really just needed those people to show up. So those people who came with a hug, a card, a meal, and wine. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> just showing up. Yeah. 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 I think when I hear the ladies talk, I think about something we talk about in the bereavement world called a dual process model of thinking about grief. And that's where we have our grief going along on a path. But at the same time, life is happening too. So how are we dealing with both at the same time, recognizing that sometimes our grief is going to be more and sometimes the grief will move down and life, you know, if it's keeping up with our kids' activities or social engagements, that those things will kind of take, you know, the, the more important role. So I think what you've been talking about sounds normal and it's nice to maybe put it in that framework because I don't think grief always feels normal. Of course, so, of course. Mm -hmm. Teresa, you talked about um, when we were talking about this show, um, you talked about how you never move on from grief. You move mm -hmm. forward in life with their memories alive and their protection mm -hmm. now from above. For both of you, how has your experience changed you as a daughter, as a wife, as a parent? Um, and in what ways have you grown personally? Yes, I'm, you know, I don't think you ever fully heal from mm -hmm. losses like this and, mm -hmm. you know, we'll be forever broken, but there are definitely parts of us that become stronger mm -hmm. and more resilient and definitely um, myself and my children are definitely more empathetic towards others mm -hmm. and um, we are ready to now lend that helping hand and to give back to others in their time of need. Mm -hmm. And for me, it really, uh, to keep my father's name alive, I started a foundation in his name called Phil Lawler Batting for a Cure. And so the foundation raises money for patients that can't afford their chemotherapy treatments. Mm. So I really dove myself into mm -hmm. that. Now diving myself into that, I also don't think I fully was able to, you know, you're still grieving through that whole process. Mm -hmm. But every time I had an event and I was able to speak his name, I felt mm -hmm. so much more alive. Mm -hmm. What advice do you all have for people who are um, either learning of a diagnosis or they have a family member who's going through a diagnosis um, and just through your experience, what would you tell people um, now that you have experienced it and are on the other side? Well, I definitely would say to keep the hope, stay positive, be blessed and thankful for all that you do have. And I would also say get tested early. Mm. Uh, make sure you do your re regular physicals and get your mammograms, get your colonoscopies because sometimes it wouldn't have gone as far if you had gotten a test yeah. that much faster. Yeah. Susan? Anything? Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to mention that I think the way you've talked about continu your continuing bonds with your loved one, uh, you know, your ability to be resilient and show up for other people now, that's a way of keeping those bonds with your husband and your dad. And I think with the foundation, you know, that's a really important way to continue a bond. So I applaud you both. Absolutely. Thank you both. We are talking about grief on Dana B and Dana. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. In Naperville, we know that community counts. In fact, it's in our name. As Naperville Community Television, we have the privilege of showcasing what makes this award-winning city a wonderful place to raise a family, to make a living, and to enjoy life's journey. That's why it's our mission to capture on camera those special moments that connect us. Those stories that impact our lives, stories you won't see anywhere else. 
to watch Naperville Community Television on air, online, and on social media. This episode of Dana Being Dana is brought to you in part by Grow Wellness Group, counseling, coaching, and wellness for community, work, and life. Welcome back to Dana Being Dana, where we are talking about grief. We have discussed losing loved ones, and there are so many other ways people are struggling with grief. As a result, depression, anxiety, and suicide rates are higher than they have been in years. Joining me now are my friends Kimberly K. Rea and therapists Adam Ratner and Wendy Hayam Gross of Grow Wellness Group. Grief isn't just about losing life. How are other people grieving and struggling in loss during this time? What types of losses? You know, I think the first one that comes to mind is just the loss of normalcy. Yeah. Whatever your regular life was, isn't right now. Everyone's had change and everyone's had to adapt, adapt to those changes. And whether it's job loss or your children are home or it just goes on and on. I think, Adam, we talk about this at the office sometimes, right, of all the different ways um, that we're experiencing loss. And you probably have some more to add. Yeah, I mean, I would say generally anytime we have an expectation of how things should go and they don't go that way, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a job, um, whether it's a phase of life, you know, maybe we're getting a little bit older and we can't do the same things that we used to do. Um, in the times of COVID, you or know, you've gotten to a place in life and it wasn't what you expected. Remember when you were younger and you were like, at 25, I'm going to be grown with you know, everything 30, done. I'm going to be married yeah. and, and have kids and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And when that's not happening for you the way you want it to be. Right. Mm -mm. Or what we expected it to be like yeah, when we had kids. kids. I mean, and some of this has nothing to do with what's going on right now. Right. Um, right. But really, the, the biggest difference between the two is, you know, if we consider one bereavement, the loss of a human, mm -hmm. and then the other one, you know, just true grief and loss, they're both loss. Yeah. Uh, the recovery process is somewhat similar, but they're both loss. And the symptoms actually are rather similar. How does grief differ from sadness? Hmm. I would, my answer to that one would be sadness is a symptom of grief. Mm. So I don't know that necessarily, I guess they are different, um, but I would say one is a subset of the other one. Is grief normal and is there shame in grief? In terms of normal, there is not one person on this earth that has not gone through some semblance of grief and loss in their life. Everybody has lost something. Everybody has expected something to happen and it has not happened. Uh, in terms of the shame piece, is there shame and grief? No, there's no shame and freaking grief. <laughs> um, we all do it, we all go through it. Some of it's more pronounced than others. And I would say the only times people generally feel shame associated with grief are the symptoms that they exhibit and how it impacts the people that they care about. Right. Um, the shame and, and being vulnerable and asking for help. Um, obviously males are the main culprit, but look. This Who's the main culprit? Males. <laughs> <laughs> um, males, but obviously, you know, females the same. It's yeah. an admission of weakness. Yeah. Uh, and then the last one that I tend to see is when those who have been suffering for so many years realize what they have been, why? And it's this grief and loss component. And then there's the shame, like, I lost all these years. And like part of it's guilt, some of it's regret, and part of it's shame. Mm -hmm. um, and then how the symptoms manifested and how you may have pushed people away over that period of time. Yeah. Well, I think you're right because you know, when I say shame, that doesn't normally come to mind when I think about grief, but embarrassment does, right? Embarrassed that you're feeling the way that you feel. You think people think you should pull yourself up by the bootstraps and just get on with it, right? Yeah. And, and also guilt. I think when we lose things that are important to us, that are dear to us, um, we think, should I have done something differently, right? Could I have done something to change this? And I almost see the embarrassment and the guilt more in practice than the shame. Well, I'll come to you from a little bit of a different angle. I own a dance and fitness studio on the northwest side of Chicago. And we almost lost the studio during this time mm. because of the pandemic, right? And people being fearful 
And I'll say one of the most important things I think, you know, from my perspective is that people stay healthy and exercise. So we're at a crossroad to, to soothe and comfort our members at the same time try to remain open during something that's so, um, like you said, you know, there's frustration. Uh, I feel guilty I'm not making it as, as the fearless leader of this right. studio, right? And then you have all these members that are potentially losing jobs and not mm -hmm. having the opportunity to work out, either being scared or, or not being able to afford it any longer. Mm -hmm. So I hear you 100% on that. Kim, you're also a motivational speaker, and you inspire so many people, not just through your fitness studio, but just through some of your talks. How do you inspire people to navigate and move through grief? Well, that's a great question, having gone, gone through something I've never been through before. I, I've changed because of it, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to help others when, you, when you're you know, in the toilet during this time, mentally, you know, a mental fatigue set in. And, and, and as I started to talk, you know who I am. I'm very transparent with that stuff. You know, I let others know that I'm suffering. This is really hard. I get it. Talk to me. Let's have each other. So kind of learning this year, as, as bad as some people say 2020 was, it was kind of a, an awakening for me that mm -hmm. you, your people stepped up. Your members opened up. You're able to open up with them. And I think just able to communicate and being transparent and honest really helped others feel better. You're not alone. And I think being able to, to talk about that yeah. um, openly. Remember when people were sheltering in place mm -hmm. and then people started coming outside in the neighborhoods yeah. and you would see people walking around and people were just kind of talking. It's being able to commiserate um, and have conversation and, and talk to one another. Why do people put a timeline on grief? Thinking that, you know, well, you know, it's been a year. It's been two years. Um, why, why do people do that? It's freaking reassuring. Best. Yeah. It's reassuring. Uh, there's all sorts of studies and research out there. You know, some say six months, some say a year, some say 15 years. It depends on the individual. It depends on the relationship. The relationship with the loss or the relationship, you know, obviously if it's a human loss. Right. But there is no time frame or progression that is the same for one individual to the next. There is no time frame. For some people, it can manifest through a very long period of time and lean to anxiety and depression and mm. a host of other challenges, identity crisis in particular. Mm. When does normal grief turn into depression or anxiety? Mm. I love how everyone looks at me. Um, <laughs> You're the expert. So normal grief, if there's, and I hate the word normal. I'll be the first one yeah. to say I hate that word, usual. But there is no such thing as normal. Um, grief is different from anxiety and depression. Now, you can be depressed and be grieving. You can be anxious and be grieving. Any combination of those things. I like to think of them as they're siblings. They come together. Mm -hmm. But they're three separate things. And any thing that bothers anyone, no matter what it is right now, if you add loss to it, and we're all experiencing loss. In this pandemic, no one has gone unscathed. Mm. It just exacerbates all the other things that come along with it. What do you do when you notice other people who are struggling in grief? What, what do you recommend for people who notice other people who are going through a tough time? Things that I would look for first would be, you know, decrease in motivation. I mean, a lot of this loss can lead to major questions in identity and how people view the world and interact with other people. We all know what our friends, our relatives, the people that we hang with, we, we know what their like baseline is, right? Mm. And I think one of the nicest things that we can do for people is help them become aware, right, of the fact that they're not quite themselves. And we can say it in a loving way. We don't have to say, hey, you're acting really bad right now. Um, we can say, you know, I've noticed that things, you just don't seem to be your usual self. Would you like to talk about it, right? Just gently be a friend. I'll tell you from the perspective of owning a studio, we have 18 instructors on our team. And one of the daily practices I tried to do during the COVID was make sure that I just reached out. So it wasn't even, you know, you don't look well or, you know, I don't know what you're mm -hmm. going through, but just, right. a, just a reminder of how special you are to me and how much I appreciate you and your time doing our free classes that we did during right. the time. I think that's good, sometimes focusing on the positives mm -hmm. um, and, and letting other people know, you know, how you care and looking, like you said, for some of those responses, if they're withdrawn, less motivated, if you can't reach them, right? Mm -hmm. They could be really, really going through something. Apathetic, loss of motivation, all sorts of different things. Change but, in appetite. Yeah, yeah. But usually greeted with awareness on the other person's behalf and then mm -hmm. an empathy, because we see something that perhaps even they do not. Yeah. 
What advice do you have for those loved ones who may be experiencing mm. emotional abuse? I think sometimes people lash out and they are out of character. Um, they can be manipulative, they can be hurtful, they can be unkind because they may be experiencing grief. They may be unhappy with certain aspects of their lives mm -hmm. that cause them to attack others. Yep. So my advice would be this, and I would say the first part of it is why would we give this individual slack um, if he is, if something feels abusive or something feels like, man, we're always being attacked. Um, but to approach that individual with a certain degree of awareness and empathy based on what they might be going through, right. which is tremendously important just in the context of the relationship and communication. The next thing would probably be, and this in, really is based on the, the notion or the, the assumption that both sides want to be able to communicate and resolve things in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. So having conversations, tough ones, mm -hmm. uh, where we can come up with a strategy, yeah, you're suffering, what can I do to help you? Now at the same time, the person that's suffering and going through grief and loss may not be in a place where they can go there. Um, and that's where couples counseling comes in and it's, look, it's an objective party that can see things as they are. You know, we talk about emotional abuse, we talk about physical abuse, and sorry to say, during the pandemic and quarantine, we've seen increased domestic violence, and I think the first thing we have to think about is safety, right? It doesn't matter if it's he or she or they, or it doesn't matter. Um, people have to feel safe in their homes, and so I always like the old saying from the airplane, put your oxygen mask on first before you help mm -hmm. others. Yeah. So make sure if, if you're the target of, of this, anger or irritation or whatever is coming from this, make sure you're taking care of yourself first yeah. because you can't help someone else if you're not strong, if you're not in a good place. Absolutely. And whether that be separating yourself, um, seeking therapy, seeking help. And your own supports. Creating I mean. your own support system, right. your own support network. Uh, I think all of that is so incredibly important. Everything I would prescribe to the person that's grieving, I'd probably also prescribe to the person that is living with the person that's grieving, to be honest with you. And that makes sense? Yeah. That makes sense. 2020 was a tough year, as we have all, at a minimum, been grieving life the way that it used to be. Nothing is the same. The holidays this year will be especially tough for many as we grapple with our first season of loss and change as a result of all that 2020 has brought us. Many have lost jobs, lifestyles, relationships, and of course the loss of life due to COVID and other causes. Be gentle with yourself. Lean on your support system. If you don't have one organically, you can begin now in building one strategically. And look out for your loved ones who may be struggling. We all get by with a little help from our friends. Thank you to my guests for joining me to share their very personal stories in the hopes of helping others. Special thanks to Grow Wellness Group for their expertise on grief which is now more important than ever. Hopefully you have been entertained, if not encouraged or inspired. I do not promise to be an expert, nor do I have all the answers. I'm just Dana being Dana. See you next time. This episode of Dana Being Dana is brought to you in part by Grow Wellness Group, counseling, coaching, and wellness for community, work, and life.